just thinking about the, you know, the next generation and um, maybe some challenges that you guys might face that um, we haven't, uh, or many older people uh, haven't. And um, I just thought it'd be helpful today to look at the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to Daniel chapter 3. And uh, the title this morning is Standing Up for Jesus. Standing Up for Jesus. Uh, Let me pray for us one more time and we'll get started here. Uh, Lord Jesus, we, um, we love you and we are grateful to be loved by you. And God, I pray that you would help me now, help us now to hear your word, to learn from the example of three uh, godly young men who were courageous for you. And I pray, God, that you would give us the courage to stand in the time and place in which you have appointed for us, that we too might bear witness and testimony to the God who is mighty to save. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, again, as I said, I wanted to share with you what I hope is a a timely word that's fitting for all people, all of God's people at all times, but especially, I think, for the next generation. It's a good message to hear. It's an important message to hear. It's, It's a surprisingly common message throughout both the Old and the New Testaments, and that is the need for courage to stand for God and for Christ in the times and places in which he has appointed for us. I want to show you a picture this morning. Um, This is a a gentleman. You hopefully can see him there. This is a very famous photograph. You see that guy? You see what everyone's doing? That is the Nazi salute. Okay, and you have one lone gentleman there uh, whose name is August Landmesser. August Landmesser. And in that huge crowd of people, he refuses to do the Nazi salute. You see, what happened to August, according to the internet, which never lies, um, uh, that, that he had married a Jewish woman. He met a Jewish woman, he fell in love, and he found himself in a situation where he could not join in with the crowd. Um, it's a sad story, in fact. His wife would end up being killed in one of the Nazi murder camps. Uh, he himself would be um, imprisoned for some time and then eventually be forcibly drafted um, into the Nazi army and would later be um, become missing in action, you know, most likely killed in battle. The question is, the question I think that's important for all of us to ask at some point in our lives is if we were in that position, would we be? August Landis. The Bible talks about standing up for Jesus, to be unashamed of our Lord and Savior. We stand up for Jesus not because we fight for him, not because Jesus needs us to fight for him. We stand up for Jesus because Jesus fights for us. Because Jesus is the great king. He is the Lord. He is the savior of the world. In our best moments as believers, we know deep down in our hearts that to have Jesus is to have everything. To not have Jesus is to have nothing. And so we must never be ashamed to belong to Jesus Christ. We live in a generation that is not unlike Jesus's. Uh, Jesus's words here in Mark 8.38, I think, apply to us as well. Jesus said, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. We can stand up for Jesus because we're not ashamed of him. We can stand up for Jesus because in grace upon grace, he's not ashamed of us. And so today we're going to look at a story of some well-known young men who were put in a very difficult situation and chose to stand up for God. And we're going to read about this in Daniel chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. If you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. 
Going to read a long passage here. It's a familiar story, but I think it's an important one. Daniel chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. It says, Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trick, and harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I've set up? If Now if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trick, and harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I've made well and good. But if you do not worship you shall be immediately cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will be able to deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and his expression of, the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them to the burning fiery furnace. Then these men uh, were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. No smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. The word of God. You may be seated. We're going to talk about standing up for Jesus today, and we're going to talk about it um, under two headings here. First, I want to talk about the challenges we'll face for Christ, the challenges we face for Christ. And then the second thing I'm going to talk about is uh, how we overcome for Christ, how we overcome for Christ. So the first thing I want to look at here is the challenges that we face for Christ. And the first challenge that I want to talk about that we can see clearly here in this passage is the challenge of peer pressure. It's the challenge of peer pressure. So it says that King Nebuchadnezzar sent and he gathered the satrap, prefects, the governors, counselors, treasurers, justices, magistrates, officials. This is all in verse, uh, verse two there of chapter three. So in other words, so in other words, he gathered literally every person of any importance or significance whatsoever in his entire kingdom. 
was there on the plain of Dura to stand in front of this golden image. Now, listen, you know, let's just do an exercise there. So let's just do an exercise. So just close your eyes for a second. Close your eyes for a second. And just imagine that you're there and you're on this big, wide, open plain. Okay? And you look around and there, and there are people, I mean, people everywhere, thousands of people all around you. <laughs> and they are clear, they're well-dressed men. They're men of means. They're men of importance. They're, the, they're, they're, they're all the important officials of the entire kingdom of Babylon, which is one of the largest and most powerful kingdoms in the entire world. And you're just surrounded by all these people. Okay? So you look around. You look around and they're everywhere. And you look up in front of you. You, you look up in front of you. And there's this massive golden statue. It's 90 feet tall. It's about, it's about six and a half stories high. Okay? This massive golden statue in front of you, and it's just standing there, this great image <coughs> that Nebuchadnezzar had, had set up. And so you're looking around, and there's all these people, and this great golden image just is looming over you. It's casting its shadow upon you, and you just sit there, and you look at it, surrounded by all these people, and deep in your heart, you know what's about to happen. They're about to start playing music. And every single one of the most important men in the entire kingdom are about to fall on their faces before an idol. But you're a Jew. And you haven't forgot what your fathers told you. You haven't forgot what the priests read to you in the temple in Jerusalem. You know it well. It's the second commandment inscribed by the finger of God onto the tablets of stone given from God himself to the people of Israel. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. So here's the question. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? The music plays, and what are you going to do? You can open your eyes now. You should do What is this? This is ultimate peer pressure. One of the greatest pressures we face in life is peer pressure. The, bio, the biblical term for this is called fear of man. And Proverbs says the fear of man is a snare. Have you ever sat down and thought about how much of what you do in life is actually motivated by how other people will perceive it? Think about it. How many times do you think, oh, I can't do that because so-and-so will think? How much of what we do is motivated by how other people will perceive it? And I'm not saying that's always a bad thing, but I'm saying that we have to be aware of the pressure that society places on us. Social media has just magnified and amplified this in our society. And in my opinion, social media has literally made the entire world like a middle school lunchroom. Because why? Because y'all remember being in middle school? Y'all, y'all, my mom made me keep my rat tail till the eighth grade. I wanted to die every day. You know how insecure you are as a middle schooler? So aware of what, you know, how you're perceived by your peers, how other people are looking at you, what other people are thinking about you. Now the whole world is a middle school lunchroom because now you can be sitting in your bed all alone and people are looking at you through your social media. And they're thinking, why did they say that? Why didn't they say this? Oh, I want them to know this. Or I want them to know that. The whole world's a stage. And we're on it. And it creates these instant feedback loops where you can immediately receive a pat on the back or cruel criticism, just like that. The drop of a hat. While you're sitting all alone at the house. 
So the question for us then is what will we do as Christians when it's unpopular to be a Christian? You know, and, and I just want to say, if you haven't noticed it, just to borrow a phrase from Jesus, the time is coming and is now here. When that's the, good, that's the case. Now, I mean, when, if you get outside uh, your, your, your Christian bubble and you go onto the campus of a major college university or you go to a major city where all the movers and shakers of society are, most of the time if, in the, the, in, 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 in the, the big places of the world where, where society really lives, the big influential places in, uh, in the United States, and you tell them that you're a Christian, they're not going to give you a pat on the back. They're just not. It's not a badge of honor in many places, but already in many places it's a mark of shame. And so the question is, will we succumb to the peer pressure of the world? You know, the Apostle Paul uh, experienced a great deal of pressure from his Jewish contemporaries to, to soften the gospel, to make it more palatable to Jews. And this is, but this is what he says in Galatians 1.10. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So at the end of the day, you got to choose. Are you going to, are you going to try to please men or you got to try to please God? Cause lots of times in life, you're going to have to choose. So the first thing we face will be peer pressure. The second thing that we see here. Uh, besides peer pressure, is malicious accusations. Malicious accusations. In verse 8 there, it says that some of the Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. Uh, they refused to bow down. They refused to worship the, the kings of the nation's false god. Now remember, so like in ancient times, right, uh, worship of the kind of national deity was kind of seen as a mark of, of political submission and political unity. And so there was not this, uh, there was not this at all any type of understanding like we have of like separation of church and state in any sense. Okay? And, and so in that, so in other words, refusal to worship the national deities is, would be akin to political treason. Now the Jews were different from other, the other nations, of course. They had different practices. They had strict dietary laws. They weren't supposed to worship idols. They did things that others didn't. Daniel prayed three times a day. They didn't do things that others did. They wouldn't eat the unclean food or worship idols. And we can imagine, right, that their refusal to join into the worship and customs of the, of the Babylonians made the Babylonians uncomfortable. And the, easy, the easiest accusation in those kind of instances is the accusation of arrogance and pride. I mean, I mean, it's just think about it, right? The, the Jews, they're in Babylon, and they're, you know, and the Babylonians are doing all this, but the Jews won. And, just, and the, the Babylonians are thinking, you know, well, why don't you do, why don't you do what we do? You think you're better than us? You think you're smarter than us? What we do isn't good? It's not good enough for you? It's a lesson for us, right, that the righteous Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are actually accused of being evil themselves because they refused to join in with the sin of the Babylonians. Now, I just want to say we must not be naive and assume that such things will never happen to us because they almost certainly will. People will malign you and possibly even verbally assault you because you hold to the 2,000-year-old teachings of the Christian church. So now, so just, just remember, so just remember, what we believe, so like, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if the Holy Spirit lives in you, God, by His Spirit, has confirmed in your heart that you belong to Jesus Christ, that His Word is inspired, and that He is right, good, and true. And so that means that you believe in His heart, that you believe in your heart, that the teachings of the Bible are good, they're not bad. They're good. That God knows what he's doing. That he didn't just make things up. But that he's following his good and perfect will in all that he does. And that the church has believed the same things for 2,000 years. So remember that whatever place you find yourself in, 
You know, you're, you're standing on the solid rock. You're standing on the solid rock. So don't be ashamed. Already, many people today have been labeled backward, bigoted, hateful. Especially today around issues relating to uh, um, sexual orientation and gender identity. Okay, those are the hot button issues today. Okay, the question is, what are we going to do about it? When we're faced with the choice, when we're faced with the choice of, of, of bowing down to things that God has clearly spoken on or not, what are we going to do? You got to make a decision. You got to choose. I wish we did, I wish that this, some, you know, I wish that this decision didn't have to be made. But many times it will, and I believe we're in a place where it will. Choose between being accepted by society or being a Christian. And I, my concern is that there are many people who have good intentions who think, well, if we just love people well enough, then they'll still like us even if we're Christian. And, and many times that will be true. But I just want to say, sometimes it won't. Sometimes you can love people as well as you possibly can. But at the end of the day, because you refuse to accept them on their terms, they will count you the enemy. Doesn't matter how good you are. Doesn't matter how well you love them. Doesn't matter what you've done for them. Because you won't accept them on their terms, contrary to God's commands, they they will count you an enemy. In other words, I do believe that we are at a point, and it's increasingly so, that our culture is reaching a place where, you know, there was a time where it was like, well, we can just be, we can agree to disagree and it will be okay. We'll agree to disagree. We'll be fine. We can still be friends. But look, that day is quickly vanishing before our eyes because it's, it won't be okay to, it won't be uh, agree to disagree because we're reaching a place where if you can't celebrate what they celebrate, you're the bad guy. If you can't celebrate, Sin, you're the bad guy. And I just want to say, you know, this is, but this is New Testament. This isn't like, this isn't like, you know, some kind of cultural, like, persecution complex. Jesus said that this would happen. The apostle said that this would happen. First Peter 4, all right? He said, for the time that is past suffices for what is doing what the Gentiles want to do. Living in sensuality, Passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. And they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Matthew 5.10, Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you. And persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. That will happen. People will tell lies about you. People will assume the worst about you and your motives. They just will. And it will be so hard and so painful because you know that it's not true about you. But the pressure will be so immense because you don't want to be thought of in that way to yield. I just want to say, stand up. In fact, Jesus said it's a blessing. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecute the prophets who were before you. So we got peer pressure, we got malicious accusations. And then the, the third thing, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is loss or violence. We could face loss or violence. In verse 19 through 21 there, when Nebuchadnezzar um, ordered ordered that they be burned alive. Burned alive. He was pretty mad. We may at times be called to endure loss and even violence for Christ's sake. You know, in ancient times, disobedience to the will of the king was not an option. So, I mean, you know, I mean, literally, they're, they're, they're telling no to the most powerful person in the world. So, you, uh, you got some gumption. Let's, let's say that. 
But you know, it's not just ancient times. Um, I think a real kind of kind of a real issue today is that people don't read history. And if you don't read history, you're doomed to repeat it. So I encourage everyone to pick up a history book and read about communist Russia. Read about fascist Germany. Read about these uh, totalitarian regimes where, where saying no to Nebuchadnezzar, saying no to the will of the party could get you in a gulag or a concentration camp or worse. Okay, that's, it, you know, that's not that long ago. It's not that long ago. There are people alive who remember that. And probably one of the greatest dangers, I think, in America right now is the thought, is, is the naivety that says, that would never happen here. I just want to say, really? What makes you so sure? I hope it doesn't, ha- I don't, I hope it doesn't happen, and I'm not predicting the future. I'm just saying it could, and if it does, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Are we, are we better than our brothers and sisters over 2,000 years of church history who've been called to suffer for the name? How many saints and martyrs over the past 2,000 years have been called to times and seasons in life where they, in fact, were called to yield up their lives for the sake of the name of Christ? It might not happen to us. I hope it doesn't happen to us. But we would be fools to say it couldn't happen to us. And we have a scriptural call to be ready to endure for the sake of Christ. The threat of loss or violence. It could be losing your job. That's already happening. Right? That's already happening. Right? If you don't, if you don't, if you don't, you know, walk in step with all the, the new guidelines put in place in your job, then you could easily lose your job. If you don't affirm so-called gender identity of your child, they could be taken away from you. It's happening. I mean, if you were, if you were, we just, because we've never experienced anything like that, many of us, some of you have, but many of us haven't. Because we've never experienced anything like that, we just think it could never happen. But just, again, go read a history book, go read a biography. One day, you're a German Christian you're just living your life. Everything's fine. Then the next day, oh, this this uh, this really intense, likes to yell, charismatic man just got elected chancellor, named Adolf Hitler. Wow. Okay, that's kind of I don't know how I feel about him. And then the next day, there's a world war. And then what? What are you going to do? Suffering for Jesus. We, it can happen. The question is, what are we going to do? The Bible says that suffering for the name is a blessing. It's an honor. It's a gift from God. In Acts chapter 5, it says, When they had called the apostles, they called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. And then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. So no, look, we don't go seeking it out. But sometimes God calls us to it. And if we do, I just, the call today is to say, is I, I want you guys to have thought about it. I don't want you to be caught off guard. I want you to think about the possibilities of what we could, you could possibly face for the name of Christ. So number one, challenges we face for Christ. Peer pressure, malicious accusations, loss of violence. And number two, how we overcome for Christ. How we overcome for Christ. Uh, Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's answer is very instructive there in verses 15 and following. Um, it says here, Nebuchadnezzar said, If you're ready, when you hear the sound, so forth, um, to fall down and worship the image that I've made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately cast to the burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will be able to deliver you out of my hands? But then in verse 16, it says, They answered to him and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us 
out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. So how do we overcome for Christ? What internal resources do we need to stand up for Jesus if and when the time comes? Number one, we need confidence in God's ability. Confidence in God's ability. Now, now remember, if you kind of read between the lines here, I think Nebuchadnezzar thought when he brought them forward and he gave them a second chance that they were going to change their minds. It seems, it seems that that's what he thought. So I could just, you know, Nebuchadnezzar was kind of a proud dude. I don't know if you picked up on that from reading the book of Daniel. Kind of a proud dude. And so God liked to humble him. Okay? And so I'm sure he was patting himself on the back. Oh, I'm such a merciful ruler. I'm giving these guys a second chance. But what he didn't realize was that when he gave them a second chance, they were going to double down and say, in their refusal to bow down to an idol. You see, they had confidence in God's ability. Nebuchadnezzar, look what he said there. He says, uh, he says, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hand? Well, he's not, he's not attacking Nebuchadnezzar. He's not attacking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego there. He's jabbing at God. Now, that's one person you don't want to pick a fight with. What God can save you from me? Well, let me show you. And, that, and those three young men gave Nebuchadnezzar an education that day. We don't even have to answer your question. That's a, that's a dumb question. So there's no such thing as a dumb question. That's a dumb question. What God can save you from me? God, God. That's who. We don't even need to answer your question, Nebuchadnezzar. Our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses, Joshua, and David, the God of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. We might say today, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is able to save us. They had wholehearted belief in God's power to save. You see, they they didn't doubt it. They See, Nebuchadnezzar thought he was king. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego understood that God is king. Nebuchadnezzar could do nothing unless God allowed it to happen. So he made a fatal error. He thought he was in control when God was in control. And so... The internal resources that we're going to need in the moment of trial in our lives is to remember that whatever situation you find yourself in, whatever situation you find yourself in, something is going to, something else besides God is going to seem like it's in control. And what you got to remember at that moment is no, God's in control. The government ain't in control. The boss ain't in control. Whatever situation you find yourself in, the disease ain't in control. God's in control. You see, he is able to deliver us. God has power over nations. God has power over kings. God has power over life and death. You see that? They really, but who can stand up against the most powerful man in the world? Well, someone who serves somebody more powerful. And they, and in their heart of hearts, they just knew. Nebuchadnezzar, you think you're in control, but look, I'm not going to die unless God wants me to die. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar himself would come to acknowledge this in Daniel 4.35. It says, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. He does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? You got to give Nebuchadnezzar some credit. At least he, at least he uh, acknowledges when he's been beat. These young men, in the face of being burned alive, weren't concerned because their God reigns. So confidence in God's ability, number one. Number two, we're going to have to have surrender to God's will. Surrender to God's will. It says there in verse 17 and 18, God is able to deliver us out of our hand, and he will deliver us. But in verse 18, but if not, be it known that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. You see, they knew that God could save them. 
They believed that God could save them and would save them. But this is what they said. This is how they doubled down. But they said, but even if he doesn't, I'm not going to bow down to that. Even if he doesn't save me, I'm not going to bow down to that. We will not worship a lie. We will not bow down to a falsehood because God is God and they knew the truth. In other words, this is what they knew deep in their hearts, that it's better to die for God than to live for the devil. It's better to die for the truth than live for a lie. Let me think about it, church. Look, God doesn't owe us anything. God gave us everything. Right? If God takes our life away, he hadn't done anything but just take back what he gave us in the first place. So what does that mean for us? It means if we live, we live for God. And if we die, we die for God. But one thing we must be unwilling to do is to say, I'm going to take the life that God gave me and live it for something else. That fate, Jesus said, would be worse than death. Matthew chapter 10, verse 26. Jesus said, so have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But, Whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. So, brothers and sisters, I pray that you never have to face anything I'm talking about. I pray you never have to face losing a job or losing a relationship, someone you care about deeply. Uh, Definitely not losing your life. I pray you never have to face anything like that. But if we understand Christ's words here, these things are not only possible, but we can very likely be called to them. And if that day ever comes, the question that I'm putting before you today is the question that the text puts before us, is, and that is this. Will we fear man more than we fear God? Will we fear him who kills the body but cannot kill the soul? The question for us today, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is will we be willing to stand even if the whole world is bowing down? Will you die for Jesus before you live for the devil? Can you set it in your heart to know that God can deliver you, but even if he doesn't? You won't tell a lie, but live for the truth, whatever the cost may be. Trust me, whatever, whatever the world can threaten you with, God can do worse. Far worse, hear me now, far worse than being denied by society, as painful as that is. Far worse than losing a close relationship, as painful as that is. Far worse than losing a job, as painful as that is. Far worse than being denied by the world. Would to be to stand before God and have Jesus Christ himself deny you before the Father. Far better is to lose everything for the sake of the name, if that's what God calls you to. So that when you stand before God, Jesus will say, He's with me. Confidence in God's ability. Surrender to God's will. Finally, number three. 
allegiance to God alone. They had allegiance to God alone. Even if God doesn't save us, they would rather die than bow down to a false god. You see, bowing down, if they bowed down to everybody with everybody else, what would they be doing? They'd be telling a lie. They'd be telling a lie. That there is legitimacy to that idol. That there is legitimacy to that falsehood. And that would be tempting. It would be very tempting. This is a, this is a challenge. I've thought about this some. It would be tempting in our hearts to say, you know what? You know, I can just, I know what's true in my heart. And I believe that. And I know that's wrong. So I'm just going to bow down with everyone else. And I'm just not going to believe what they believe. It's very tempting. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is, is God going to be okay with that? Would this story be the story that it is in the Bible if the young men did that? Oh, we know in our heart God's the true God, but we're just going to bow down to do what? To save our own skin? If we act just like the world externally, are we really different from the world internally? If we're not courageous enough to tell the truth with our external lives, do we really think that we hold the fast to the truth in our internal lives? The book of Revelation was written, I believe, to prepare Christians to suffer for Christ as we wait for our final deliverance. One day, Jesus Christ is going to come back, and when he does, he's going to deliver his people, he's going to vindicate their faith, and he's going to judge the world. Okay? And in the book of Revelation, a common word used in the book is the word overcome or conquer. Now, when we think of overcome or conquer, we think of like, you know, Standing on a hill and planting our flag and wearing the crown and, you know, having a sword with one leg up like that. That's conquering, right? But in the book of Revelation, that's not conquering. If you read in the book of Revelation where it says overcome, it always means this. To overcome means to endure suffering without losing your faith. In the Revelation, that's always what it means. To overcome is to endure suffering for Christ without losing your faith in Christ. That's how you overcome for God. That's how you conquer for God. At the end of the book of Revelation, John exiled for his faith in Christ on the island of Patmos, sees a vision. And in this vision, it's the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. And it's descending down from heaven. God coming down to man. In Revelation 21 verse 7, this is what it says. The one who conquers, the one who conquers will have this heritage. What? What? The city. God, that's yours. If you conquer, the one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God. He will be my son. Verse eight. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. I remember one I remember one time I was reading that passage and that word just the cowardly it just hit me right here in the right here cowardly it takes courage to follow Jesus it takes courage to stand for Christ it takes courage to do the right thing when it's hard It takes courage to stand for the truth when it's going to cost you. 
Following Jesus is not for the cowardly. It's for the courageous. We live in a day that is coming and is now here. When there will be a lot of people who will bow down. Not because they believe and agree with everything. But because they just want to be left alone. But what I'm saying is that we who have who possess the spirit of God. We, can, we cannot afford to be cowardly for Jesus. The cowardly proved themselves unfit for the kingdom. In Revelation 12, 11, this is what John said. He said, they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives, even to death. That's how you conquer. That's how you conquer. You don't love your life. More than you love Jesus. That's how you conquer. Will this ever happen to any of us? I hope not. Could it happen? Yes, it could. The question is, what are we going to do? Here's another refrain from the book of Revelation. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints. Young people, old people, everybody in between. Are we going to be able to withstand peer pressure? Are we going to be able to withstand being maliciously accused and slandered and maligned? Are we going to be able to suffer loss and even death for Jesus? You know, the number one most repeated command in the entire Bible is fear not. Don't be afraid. So if you hear anything this morning, hear this. Don't be afraid. God is with you. Don't don't ever feel like you have to be ashamed of Jesus Christ. You will never, ever regret being unashamed of Jesus. You'll never regret it. Even if it even if it costs you a lot, you'll never regret being unashamed of Jesus. No matter what God calls us to for his name's sake, when we stand before God one day and he says, I stood by him and he stood for me. This one's mine. When Jesus acknowledges you before the Father, that's all that will matter. Stand up for Jesus, even if the whole world bows down. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. You are worthy of all adoration and praise. We are weak, God, but you are strong. And we know that we cannot muster up the strength. Nevertheless, God, you will give us power by your spirit. And I pray that you would on that day, whatever we may be called to face, Lord, whatever you may appoint us to do for you, I pray that should that day come, on that day we would stand up for you, that we would be proud to belong to Jesus Christ. We are proud, God, to belong to you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for delivering us. Thank you for walking through us. Give us the courage. Give us the courage, God, to live for you. If we have to stand, if you call us, God, to go through the fire, we know, Lord Jesus, that you'll be right there with us. You'll stand right there with us. It doesn't, Lord, you, you, don't, you, you, you might not, you'll call us to go through the fire so that you can stand there with us. And we can know that you'll never forsake those who put their trust in you. Bless our church.
God bless these young men and women. Oh, Lord, may they be a generation that stands firm for you. Raise them up as men and women of courage, of conviction, of holiness, of love, who will stand up for you, even if, God, all their peers are bowing down. Help them, Lord, in the callings that you place on their lives. Help us, God, as a church in these coming days to be unashamed to belong to you. And may, and may the power that you clothe us with, God, be a testimony to the lost world, as, as it was to Nebuchadnezzar, that you are the God above all gods, that none can stay your hand or say to you, what yet have you done? Let us be willing to bear witness to that, even if it means our suffering. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to